Welcome back to my Northwest Coast Ethnobotany class. I'm your host, Abe. And this week's unit is going to focus on indigenous foods. Now, I've been mentioning a lot of different indigenous foods throughout the uh, previous field trips. So rather than focus on the actual food items, I'm going to talk about um, how to cook indigenous foods. So we'll cover three different methods, but the first I'm going to talk about is how to cook food in an underground earthen oven, often called pit roasting or um, pit cooking. So let me show you the uh, necessary materials you'll need to complete this. At a bare mem minimum, you'll need uh, something to cook the food, uh, something to dig with. I'm going to be using this uh, traditional digging stick, but if you don't have one of those, a shovel works just fine. Um, and then you'll need a vessel for moving water. I'll be using this traditional bentwood box, but you could also use a bucket. Um, and then you'll need something to cover the pit with. Now, I'll be showing how to cover the pit with uh, all sorts of different vegetation, but if you don't have vegetation or it's the wrong season, you could use something like uh, a canvas sheet. You can see I've used this a number of times already. Um, the bigger the better, or um, some burlap. And burlap, uh, it's hard to find real big pieces, but you could cut open an old um, coffee um, bean sack. If you go to like a coffee roaster, they usually give them away. And uh, cut them open and they get fairly big and they work just fine. So you could use uh, canvas, burlap, or vegetation to cover the pit with. Um, and then you'll also be needing uh, things to light the fire with and gather firewood. Um, if you have all the firewood you already need, then no problem. But that can include, um, you know, a saw, a hatchet, maybe um, kindling, and uh, your firewood. So let's get right to it. So our first step is going to be to dig a hole to put the fire in. So if we're going to cook underground, we have to get down into the ground. So we can get under it. So I'm going to start by just making a big circle, loosening the ground. It takes a little longer to dig with a wooden digging tool than it does with a metal digging tool. If I'm not careful, I might end up breaking the wooden digging tool. So we're just going to be cooking uh, enough food for um, maybe four or five people. But this is a great technology for cooking food for um, huge groups of people. You could cook enough food for 200 people or more. You could cook entire animals, like a, a whole seal, or a whole black bear, or a whole deer. So you can imagine the pits would need to be much bigger for cooking whole animals. Um, and also, you could cook um, an entire year's worth of food if it's later going to be dried. So I've mentioned camas in some of the lectures. And of course, camas is a really important traditional food. And the way the camas is traditionally cooked, it's harvested around this time in May. And then the entire um, year's worth of camas is put inside of a cooking pit and um, cooked for like 36 hours all at once. And, um, and then the bulbs are uh, squished flat and sun dried. So even though it takes a long time to cook the camas, um, it's kind of a convenience food once you've cooked it and dried it because then all you have to do is rehydrate it. It's a little bit like beef jerky or something. So I still have a long ways to go on this cooking pit. Um, obviously softer soils are nice for these cooking pits um, and sometimes people along the coast make their cooking pits on the beach because uh, the sand is really easy to dig um, and things like clams are commonly steamed in a, a very similar but usually shallower um, pit to the pit I'm going to be creating. So 
This digging stick is made out of yew wood, and yew wood is a very strong wood. So we're going to make this um, deep enough that we generate um, probably twice in, twice as much soil. Um, we actually are going to need this, the spoils from this hole to cover the food up. Um, so essentially we're going to light a fire in the bottom of the hole. We're going to heat up the hole and a bunch of rocks that we put down there with it. And then um, put the food in there and those rocks and the soil they hold a lot of the heat, but if the if the pit is just open on the top, that heat will just escape. So we need to um, insulate the hole with soil um, and all the food in the in the hole. So we're gonna um, cover the food with more vegetation and um, some big leaves that'll keep the soil from getting down into the food, um, and then we will uh, put the soil back on top. Deeper. Deeper still. Roots. So if I was going to cook a, an, a, uh, an entire year's worth of canvas, I've read descriptions of um, these cooking pits being uh, six or eight feet in diameter. I haven't made one that big. I've made one about six feet long, um, but only a couple feet wide, and cooked an entire pig. And of course, in Hawaii, that's um, common at luau to cook something like a pig whole. And again, the Hawaiian tradition, they um, use big leaves to cover the food and keep the dirt out. And usually they use, um, well, these days they use banana leaves. We're going to be using skunk cabbage. Are we, right, we want to keep the we want to keep the walls of the pit um, firm so the dirt doesn't uh, slide off the walls. So um, we uh, don't want to 
disturb more soil than necessary on the walls if it's kind of uh, undisturbed soil it'll be it'll hold an edge really well but if it's soil that has been uh, disturbed and then repacked it won't hold an edge as well so I'm gonna make these walls a little bit smoother and a little bit steeper now and and then I think I'll call that good for the small amount of food that we're cooking. Okay, I think we're done for the hole now. So we got nice smooth walls. They're fairly steep, but they're not quite vertical because I find that oftentimes the vertical walls, they, um, they crumble more easily. Um, we got uh, a nice pile of soil to put on top and want to make sure that we have enough room around the outside of the pit to work and have the leaves that are going to keep the dirt out seal all the way around the top. So sometimes I'll put the soil in buckets or in a wheelbarrow because later we have to put the soil back on top and if you have a huge pile it's kind of uh, it takes a lot of time to move it again. You'll see in a second. All right. Now to find some rocks to line that pit with. Okay, so I have a pile of rocks here that I have uh, used in the past for pit cooks. And um, a good place to find rocks is at a beach, like a creek side or even the ocean side sometimes. You can find nice cobbles. Um, and I like to go for rocks that are usually about the size of one fist for a smaller cooking pit. And if I'm doing a really big cooking pit, like the time I cook um, the pig than um, rocks that are about the size of two fists together is good. So this, this rock is good for um, cooking food for a really long time uh, because once it heats up it'll hold that heat for a really long time. Whereas the smaller rocks like this, um, they heat up faster but they also cool down faster. So they're just in general better for using on smaller cooking pits. They also reduce this, the volume of your hole much less when you stack them in there. Um, so not all rocks are created equal. You see that you know some rocks uh, break really easily. That's natural as they heat up, um, they split. Uh, um, archaeologists actually look for split rock like this as an indication of things like cooking pits and um, cooking hearths. Um, they call it fire cracked rock or FCR for short. Um, and you know many times the volcanic rocks work a little better than the sedimentary rocks certainly and the metamorphic rocks. Um, so along the coast, I, I hear people say that the, the dark black um, volcanic rocks are often the best for um, cooking pits. So we'll uh, use this one and I'll grab a whole bunch more. A little bit big, but that'll work. There we go. 
Yeah, granite can be used. Although I find the granite doesn't isn't super resilient. Now, um, you might wonder why somebody would bother spending a lot of time getting good cooking rocks. Well, rocks are really heavy, so if you have to carry a whole bunch of rocks a long distance to your fire, you're going to want to get the best rocks possible so that you don't have to just replace them the next time you want to cook something. You want to get rocks that are durable that you could use over and over again. Now it's time to line the pit. So I like to put the biggest rocks uh, near the bottom and try and get the rocks packed in there pretty tightly. So in some applications, you have to worry about rocks um, exploding and they could be a little bit dangerous. So your rock selection, you know, there's some rocks are more prone to exploding than others. Rocks you get from water, but like right in a river channel, they might have a little more moisture trapped inside. And as that moisture expands, it can cause the rock to explode. Um, so something to keep in mind. But in a cooking pit, you actually don't need to worry about exploding rocks quite as much because um, everything's down in the ground. And so it's less likely to um, come out because we'll have a lot of firewood on top of this. And uh, the firewood will protect us from any rocks that explode. My experience is that usually they don't shoot very far. Maybe I've just been lucky with the rocks that I have. So we'll line the walls all the way up to basically just under the soil level. And it's not uncommon to not have enough rocks the first time, but this is my 36th pit cook. So I finally learning that I should get more rocks than I think I'll need. And we're actually gonna wanna have some left over to throw on the fire as it's heating up. Just about there. Okay, so some things uh, about the pit here. Um, the food is going to be going right in the center, and if I had a giant pit and not very much food, those hot rocks are going to be pretty far away from the food. So it's actually kind of important to um, size your pit for the meal that you're going to cook. Um, you don't want the rocks to be too far or too close to the food. If it's too close, the food will burn. If it's too far, the rocks just won't transfer any heat. Um, okay, so these will be rocks we're gonna throw on the wood as it's um, burning. Um, so the next step is to light a fire in this hole and then we'll, um, uh, the, the rocks will start heating up and we'll let that burn for an hour or so. We want to heat those rocks up as hot as we can get them as fast as possible. Well, for the sake of cooking, give hungry people as fast as possible. And that means we're not going to want to skimp on good kindling. So I'm going to 
put a bunch of uh, cedar shavings in here. These are just uh, from a planer. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's uh, all sorts of things you could use for tinder like this, even paper, if, uh, if you want. Of course, fine twigs in the forest work really good. And then I'm going to um, split up some cedar. This is red cedar here. The shavings are actually yellow cedar. And I think one reason that cedar is so valuable up and down the coast is because it splits so easily. If you can imagine um, trying to make boards or shingles or planks or all sorts of things out of a wood, um, and all you have is another harder wood or perhaps a bone or something to split it with, you're going to want to use a wood that splits really easily. And cedar just really likes splitting in nice, straight um, planks. So that's why cedar is so great. Now getting a fire to burn in a hole is actually a little harder than above ground and that's another reason that we really want to overdo the kindling. Fires need oxygen and it's hard to get fresh air with lots of oxygen in it down into the hole. if I needed to make my own shavings. This is what I usually do in the woods. Find a nice dry piece of cedar and cut shavings, but I have enough shavings, shavings, so I don't need to do that. So we got lots of kindling now. Um, we'll pull it out and make it a little easier to light and then add it um, once we get a fire started. Getting the flames to burn above the top of the pole is um, a good way to uh, make sure that the fire is going to be hot enough. It just burns better when, when it's tall like that. Okay, now we're ready for some bigger wood. So we got some bigger pieces to throw on.
I'm going to get even more. We want to mound the wood up all over the hole so that eventually the ashes or the coals will um, fill most of the hole up. So that should get us started and then maybe in 10 minutes I'll add even more wood. Um, but this this is a this will give us this is a good time for um, this is a good time to take a break and harvest some vegetation now because we're uh, going to need to insulate the food from the hot rocks um, and the vegetation will essentially um, keep the food from sitting right on the hot rocks. Uh, so we're going to go pick some salal and some sword fern and uh, that'll go on either side of the food um, and then some skunk cabbage leaves to put over the top to keep the dirt from falling into the hole. Um, and sealing the hole up to keep the steam from escaping from the hole. So let's go pick some veg. Uh, fern fronds work really well, and I often use um, sword fern, but uh, this is actually a good time of the year for uh, getting these dead um, bracken fern fronds. Um, so we'll try those out. They, um, you know, they're a nice... Um, porous material where the, the heat can um, come through the fronds really easily, but the food uh, is will sit on top and it won't touch the hot rocks. So that's what we want. Here's a new uh, bracken fern frond. Sword fern fronds also work very well, and uh, at this time of the year we can see that the new fronds are um, coming out of the center of the plant, and last year's fronds are laying down, and they're actually on their way out. So let's take advantage of um, the very little impact harvesting of uh, collecting these old um, sword fern fronds. If you garden, you know that a lot of people will cut their old fronds off, actually uh, in the spring before the new fronds come up. So um, it doesn't really hurt the plant to do this. And I'm gonna shoot for about an arm load of uh, fern material and a small arm load of um, Salal fronds as well, or salal leaves as well. It's a good spot here. You always need more than you think. I'm in a patch of salal here, and I like to use salal for the bottom layer of vegetation because salal leaves are really thick and leathery, and they don't catch on fire easily. And so they're going to go against the hot rocks and um, per be our first layer. Now you can just break off the salal, the upper salal um, twigs, and um, it seems like it would really damage the plant, but this is an herbaceous plant that a uh, perennial shrub essentially and um, I've actually been coming back to this spot several years in a row and um, the bushes seem to bounce right back so um, I guess I can moderate my own impact because I'm returning to the same place year to year.
again, I'm going to want to get, um, you know, a decent handful of these or armload of these. I usually just get the top foot of the plant. And you don't want to skimp on the vegetation because the vegetation provides a lot of um, fluff around the food. And if you don't have the vegetation, the soil um, compacts tightly around the food and then the air, the hot air, can't actually get around the food to do the cooking. Um, so if I were to not have enough vegetation, that would be a good reason or a good explanation for why the food m might not get done. And oftentimes the first pit cook you do <laughs> isn't necessarily the best one. So I think we have enough vegetation now. Oops, a <laughs> big arm load of uh, bracken fern, sword fern, and salal. So let's see how the fire's doing. The fire's starting to look good. Um, now I like to continue to put bigger and bigger wood onto the fire um, because the small wood makes coals quickly, which is good for heating things up but eventually I'm gonna to need to take it coals out. So the bigger the coals are, the easier they're gonna to be to take out. Um, and also the bigger wood on the outside will reflect a lot, a lot of that heat back down into the fire. <sighs> Expect your fire to be smoky. Things don't like to burn in holes and uh, my wood isn't the driest. We need one more bit of vegetation. We got enough stuff to insulate the food from the rocks, um, but we don't have any vegetation to keep the dirt out. Uh, so next we need to go get some skunk cabbage leaves, which are nice and big, and they do a good job of keeping the dirt from falling down into the cooking pit. If you want skunk cabbage, you got to go to a swamp, so add uh, rubber boots to the equipment list. Skunk cabbage leaves are probably our biggest leaf. Um, I like to think of them like banana leaves, although they're not quite as big as a banana leaf. And this one isn't even full size. They can get to be about that long. Um, so I'm gonna pick about a dozen of these and just a couple from each plant to lessen my impact. Going deeper to get more. Oh, here we go. Ooh, this is a big one. This one a chunk. There's a blackberry. Ouch. Some people call skunk cabbage Indian wax paper because it's uh, fairly smooth and a little bit waxy. And um, so you could wrap food in it like you would wax paper. Um, and if you're just cooking a small thing, you could actually wrap like a potato or a chunk of salmon or a chunk of meat in several skunk cabbage leaves and bury it right in under the coals of a fire. You don't have to dig a giant pit for just a single piece of meat. I'll get a couple more. I 
think that'll be good. So the fire's <coughs> burning down nicely. And um, let's, I have this uh, digital infrared thermometer. I just want to see what the temperature is of some of the rocks. 279. Oh, that must have been something else. Okay. Yeah, 730, 950, whew, 662 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, the ground here is uh, like 60 degrees, so the fire is much hotter. I'm going to roll in a couple more rocks um, just because we want a good deal of um, heat transfer from the rocks to the food, and then I'll let it burn for another um, half hour or so before we load up the cooking fire. So we got those nice big pieces of wood now on top and um, they're going to be a lot easier to remove um, when it comes time to moving the fire and all the unburned wood out of the pit and loading it with food. <coughs> so the awaited for hour has arrived. So the rocks I think are sufficiently hot now. Uh, I'll see if I can get a reading with my thermometer here. Yeah, over 600 degrees. That one's a thousand, so over a thousand. Um, that's great. Very hot. Um, we got all our vegetation lined up. Uh, we're gonna start with the salal on the bottom. And uh, let me just talk through this in order. So the first thing we're gonna do is scoop out all the hot coals, and I'm gonna take them over to the fire pit. Um, and uh, get, get as many of the big coals out as possible. And to do that, I'm going to um, use these tongs that are made out of um, ocean spray that's been split with a little um, stub of wood to kind of keep the, keep the um, tongs open. And there's a peg to keep them from splitting all the way back. Anyway, I'll use these for the uh, smaller bits of wood. Likely a lot of the wood's too heavy for these tongs. I could have made bigger tongs, but I haven't. So I'll use a shovel for the rest. And I'll do that as quick as possible because once I start moving firewood, the uh, rocks in there are going to start um, cooling off. So I'll move the firewood out and then I'm going to throw that layer of uh, salal down on the hot rocks, make a little nest out of this um, bracken fern, maybe save a little bit of it for the top. And I'm going to put my food down. Now you can cook just about anything, but uh, we have some leftover squash, or the, our last squash from the garden, um, and also some our last potatoes from the garden, and uh, some carrots that I purchased at the grocery store. Oh, and an onion. Um, we'll throw the food in there and then cover the food with uh, the sword ferns and then the skunk cabbage um, will go on top. But before we put the skunk cabbage on, we're going to dump some water in. So here's uh, our Bentwood box with a little bit of water in it. And that water, as soon as it hits the rocks, it's going to um, turn into steam. And the steam is going to do a lot of the cooking. Uh, so once that water is in, is in I'm going to want to cover the pit up with skunk cabbage leaves as fast as possible. Steam is going to be going everywhere. It's going to be hard to see. Chaos. Um, and then we'll cover the skunk cabbage leaves with dirt to hold in as much of that steam as possible. So it's all going to go pretty quickly. Um, not sure how it's going to turn out on film, um, but the first step is going to be moving the firewood. So let's see how these little tongs do with big wood.
be enough. A couple more big pieces. Yeah, I got 970 degrees. I'm gonna try and get a little more of the charcoal out. Pretty good. Okay, so now for the vegetation. Fast here. Play with the lava. Bird fern. Food next. More uh, bracket fern, I mean. All right. Now for sword fern. Now to dump the water down the center, and then quickly put the um, skunk cabbage on. I like to layer them like shingles, starting at the bottom. layer comes a little higher up. There we go. Now to bury the whole thing with dirt. So anywhere I see steam escaping, I'll have to put more dirt. See why having your dirt in a wheelbarrow or in baskets or buckets would be convenient for quickly um, putting the dirt back and not having to scrape it through the grass. We're just about there. Steam there. A little bit of steam there. So uh, ideally, two to three inches of dirt on top is going to be best. And uh, maybe I didn't quite dig deep enough um, because my dirt might be a little bit shallow.
So we're gonna let this cook for about three hours. Usually what I do for um, potatoes that are relatively small, if I'm cooking really big potatoes with a lot of like yams or uh, big pieces of meat, then you gotta cook longer. The couple times that I've cooked a uh, pig underground, we cooked it um, for 18 hours, considerably longer. And sometimes when you need the pit to keep on cooking for um, a long time like that, it's good to light a fire on top too because the rocks will eventually cool down inside the cooking pit. So having a fire on top will um, keep the pit warmer. But he generally likes to go up more than it likes to go down, so it's best to really concentrate your efforts into getting the pit as hot as possible before you load it up. So it looks like I have a few leaks over here on the edge. And you want to make sure nobody steps on it because having some loft over the food uh, with lots of air flow between the vegetation, both over the food and under the food, um, is going to help the food cook a lot better. So if it gets stepped on, that'll compact all the vegetation. We won't get as good of air circulation and the food won't cook as well. Okay, we're ready to leave it. Everybody loves cooked food, nothing like a hot meal. And here along the Northwest coast, there are three basic methods for cooking food. Steam cooking or pit um, cooking underground in an earthen oven, uh, roasting food over an open fire, and boiling food. Now before metal pots were widely available, how could you boil food? Well across North America this has been done in a couple different ways. In the um, upper Midwest people actually boiled food in a leather bag. Um, they just filled the bag with water and added uh, hot rocks to it until the water boiled. Now in the Salish area around the Salish Sea, uh, most common uh, method for boiling food was actually a watertight basket. So the basket was woven so tightly that, um, that it held water and um, hot rocks were added to the um, basket full of water until the water boiled. Further no north on the coast, um, bentwood boxes are used for um, boiling food. So today I'm going to show you how to boil food in a bentwood box. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Bentwood box, the rocks, and how we go about moving those hot rocks into the Bentwood box. We'll start with the Bentwood box. Now, Bentwood boxes are a pretty unique technology to the Northwest Coast cultural area. Um, a normal box has maybe six sides if it has a lid, so four around the outside, a bottom, and a top. Um, and you might make a normal box out of six different pieces of wood that are all joined together. But that means you have a lot of seams that have to be tight enough in order to hold water. So this technology actually minimizes the number of seams because all the sides of the box are one piece of, piece of wood that's been bent. So the only seam on the side, it looks kind of ugly here, um, that needs to hold water is where the two ends of the board come together. And according to Agnes Alfred in the book Paddling to Where I Stand about a Kwok Wakiwak woman, um, a, a book by Daisy Seaweed Smith, a mentor of mine, um, she says that her, um, that Agnes Alfred uh, used clay to seal up that final um, side of the box. And when you use a bentwood box a lot, the wood actually expands and kind of forms a seal on its own. But um, if you don't use it very often like me, um, you're going to have to use clay to seal it. And then you also have the seams along the bottom. There's a piece of wood that the um, sides are bent around, and those uh, bottom seams also have to be watertight. So I have clay along the bottom seams and the side seam. 
So this box is adequately watertight and will hold water, and I'll fill it full of water in a second. But before I do, I want to talk about the rocks. So cooking rocks for um, a bentwood box are going to be a little smaller than the cooking rocks for an earthen pit oven. Um, what we want these rocks to do is heat up as fast as possible and then transfer their heat into the water as fast as possible. So smaller rocks are better for that. And also um, rocks that are porous, like this vesicular basalt, are really good because the heat can go in, uh, they have a lot of surface area, and that heat can um, conduct into the rock more quickly because of all the surface area. So not all the rocks I have here are the vesicular basalt. Some are just regular basalt. Um, but volcanic rocks generally work best, and um, they tend not to blow up as much. Um, and when I'm heating the rocks in a fire, like I have next to me, um, I'm not going to have a lot of firewood necessarily on top of the rocks, and so uh, there's a little more danger of a rock bursting into pieces and shooting those hot pieces at me um, than there would be if I had the fire in a hole like uh, you would do for a uh, pit cook. So the first thing I'm going to do, even before I fill this box up with water, is push the fire to the side and throw all my rocks um, onto the um, hot ground that's underneath the fire now, and then rake the fire back over the top. And I'll let that fire burn for 45 minutes or so to heat up these cooking rocks until they're almost glowing hot. A lot of rocks here. What would you do though if you didn't have enough rocks to boil the water? You just wouldn't be able to cook your food. So better to have too many than not enough. Okay, so now to pull the coals back over the fire and get the fire going again. I'm going to get a little bit of kindling and throw on there, and it'll get going real good again. For this purpose, uh, dry little twigs like this and dry dug fir needles make pretty decent kindling. Let's see, open this up and add some of that in there. And that should be enough to get it going again. Uh, we'll let that cook for, or heat up for about 45 minutes, and then we'll be ready to start transferring hot rocks into the water. Roasting food is probably the most intuitive method. Um, roasting a hot dog is as simple as getting a good long stick, skewering the hot dog, and holding it over the fire till it's done. And um, I'm going to show you how. Uh, salmon can be traditionally roasted. Now there are a many, uh, many different ways of doing it. I'm going to show you the way that I learned from Quoxie Stala, Clanchy, Fathom Dick uh, up in Kinkum. And um, we are going to essentially uh, sandwich a salmon between these two sticks. So I have the salmon fillets laid out here. Um, it's actually best if you fillet it by the butterfly method where you cut down the backbone on either side and fold the salmon open, remove the guts, and then the salmon um, fillets are still connected down the belly. Um, but I just, uh, you know, 
don't have a lot of butterfly uh, fillets because that's a lot of fish for a small family like mine. Um, so we're just going to cook these uh, two small fillets. And again, I'm going to split some cedar. And the cedar splits so nicely. Now these splints are what is going to hold the, oops, that one's too thin, what's going to hold the salmon between the two sticks. So I need, oh, maybe 10 of them. Too thin. some extras in case they don't work out. Okay. So what I want to do is lay the splints down. I'm going to move these fillets. I'm going to lay the splints down in a line like this. Probably more than enough. Then I'm going to put yeah, one more than I need. I'm going to put the fillets on, and I want the belly facing the middle. And usually you get a little more heat up towards the top, so I like to have the thicker meat um, towards the top. Now I'm going to sandwich this with some more splints. Oops, these are too close together. The wood actually is going to block the heat a little, so you don't want to have so many pieces that the heat doesn't make it to the meat. That'll be good. Okay, so now I'm going to take this and open it up, slide it over the top, and either side of these um, fish sticks are going to pinch and hold the splints together. So this uh, fish stick is made out of um, a piece of cedar. It's sharp on one end to drive into the ground. It's got um, wire around it to keep the split from tearing all the way out. And then on the top, there's some more wire to hold the splints closed. And um, a lot of people like to use cedar today because it splits so easily. Um, but from the, the ethnographic literature that I've seen says, uh, suggests that uh, woods like maple and um, ocean spray also make really good fish sticks. And I've used both of them and they work fine, but I got these handy, so. Now this is usually a two person operation. I'll see if I could do it by myself though. Open it up. Yeah, making a mess. Just want to get it centered and then I want all the sticks all the splint sticks opposing each other so that first pair is going to need a little work there we go that's good and then one on the top okay so you can see why I want to have the belly in the middle because the meat is the thinnest on the belly and it's being shielded from the heat by um, this big stick here. So now I pinch this and wrap the metal around it and that holds everything tight. You can 
Okay, so now all I have to do is stick it in the ground near the fire and we can start cooking our salmon. So, it's a little close. That's probably a pretty good distance. Yeah, that's good. And I'll rotate it a few times as it cooks. Looks like we're starting to get some juices dripping out. I'm gonna rotate it now so it'll cook from the back side. I'll probably rotate it once more to finish it off. So we got juices dripping out the back side, good sign. Um, I think the back side, they've been dripping out for a little while, so I think that's the back side's probably done. So I'm just gonna flip it back this way and give it another Oh, five minutes and then it'll be ready to eat. The fats have stopped dripping off of the fish, so that's a good sign that it is done. So we'll take it off the skewers and enjoy it. Now these wires might be a little hot. Uh, not too bad. Wrap that, open this up, and then this whole salmon packet should slide right out. Now you lose a little fish because um, it often sticks to the back of the salmon sticks, but that's just part of the character of this type of meal. go all plated and ready to eat it's lunchtime the fire has burned down to coals the rocks have got to be hot by now and I got my um, bentwood box full of water here so now I'm gonna push away some of the bigger coals and start transferring rocks from the fire into the bentwood box now when you boil water at home you probably put your cooking pot on a heating element well um, that's a little risky in this case because my cooking pot is made out of wood. Um, so instead, I'm going to transfer the hot rocks, the heating element, into the boiling water. And since the inside of the box is covered with water, I don't have to worry about the wood burning on the inside. Whew, this is very hot. I wish I had longer cooking tongs. Some of those rocks are glowing. Okay, so I'm gonna blow off the sawdust or the uh, ashes and then put them into the Bentwood box. Sizzle, sizzle. Now, if I were making a soup, I wouldn't want a little bit of ash that uh, is coming off the rocks to be in my soup. So um, I would have another pot or bentwood box and quickly dip the rocks in that other vessel before I put them into the soup pot. But this is just a demonstration. We're actually not going to cook anything in this, so I don't have to worry about it.
Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. I can tell by the noise that the ones, the vesicular basalt, um, are doing a better job of transferring heat quickly. This one's glowing a little bit, how cool. Ooh, my hands are starting to hurt. <laughs> Now it may seem like it's taking a really long time, but if you've ever tried heating up like a gallon or more of water, it, um, it's a slow process even on a giant uh, crab ring uh, that maybe you've done if you've done like a crab boil outside in the summer. Oops. Oh no, I sprung a leak.
I think we're getting close to boiling. sounds very close. That's a pre-boil rumble. All right, I'm gonna call that boiling water. We did it. I'll throw in a couple more for good measure. Yeah, look at that. So there you have it with nothing more than a fire, great cooking rocks, and a difficult to make uh, bentwood box, a pair of tongs. You could have yourself a cup of hot tea out in the bush. Okay, we sprung a leak. So I wanna collect a little data here. Uh, that's about a cubic foot of water that we had in the bentwood box. So I wanna see how many rocks it took to boil that cubic foot of water and um, use the video time log to see how long it took to actually boil that water. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63. So 63 rocks, there, there's still quite a bit of heat in them. Um, most of them are dry now. I just dumped them out of the box because of all the heat that's left in them. But if we had run out of rocks and we needed to continue cooking whatever we were boiling for longer, nothing to stop us from using our tongs to fish the rocks out of the Bentwood box, throw them back in the fire, reheat them, and then put them back into the Bentwood box. 63 rocks, I'd say a cubic foot of water, and probably something like 12 minutes, and we had boiling water. The appointed hour has arrived. Warm to the touch on top, and uh, starting to smell really good. Um, so time to remove the dirt very, very carefully um, and unearth the food. So I'm gonna um, try and brush all this dirt into a pile again. I'll probably actually work from the center, Ow, whew, hot, around to the outside. Be 
extra careful not to um, tear the skunk cabbage leaves. They're pretty tender because it's just the spring and the leaves are more tender in the spring. I have a broom and a shovel here that I might end up using, but we'll try and do it with a digging stick as much as possible. Ooh, hot. The soil can be heavy on the leaves and cause them to tear if you try and lift them up with a lot of soil. So that's why I'm being so careful to get as much of that soil weight off of the leaves as possible before I start disassembling the leaves. the top leaf. Nobody likes sand in their food. So we do the best we can to keep the dirt out. good. See, there's still a lot of heat in this pit, so if we needed to, we could probably cook this for a few more hours. Ooh, hot. There's our meal. Carrots look done. Squash looks done. Ooh, the onion is nice and soft. Potatoes are nice and soft. Uh, I'm gonna wash my hands though before I start picking up that food. So I'll be right back. All right, got a plate to put it on. Ooh, that squash looks delicious. Is this all thing in there? Mm -hmm. So 
And maybe a downside of using the bracken fern right around the food is that looks like the bracken fern is more prone to crumbling into pieces and sticking to the food. So one nice thing about cooking food that have peels like potatoes, you could just peel the potato and get rid of anything that might be on the outside. And I guess I could have left the squash whole. Um, they just cook, you know, take longer to cook if they're whole. So that's pretty much it. Uh, the, I'd say the most efficient way of uh, cooking food for a large quantity of people is to do it in an underground earthen oven like this. Um, you can, we added steam, so this is a steam pit. You could do it dry. Um, sometimes meat is cooked dry. Um, and if you were just trying to steam food for a small, uh, actually probably this size, you could, I could steam inside of a bentwood box by um, lining the bottom of the bentwood box with um, some sticks and filling it with water. Um, and then adding more hot rocks on top of those sticks in water. And then when the hot water, when the hot rocks hit the water, it creates steam and you put more sticks up on top of the hot rocks. And that keeps the food from sitting right on top of the hot rocks. And then you put a lid on your box and it's just a little um, steam pit inside of a box. So there are a number of different ways. Um, to cook food without uh, the, uh, an oven or an indoor kitchen or steel pots. And I'm hoping that today you have a better appreciation for how um, that can be done. Still done this way all over the planet. And a lot of um, Coast Salish people are kind of revitalizing this um, ancient technology for pit cooking food. So thanks for joining me and we got a, I'm going to enjoy a feast of food here. I hope you have some food at home so you're not uh, salivating over this um, and I'll catch you next time.